This podcast is a project of the Medina Focus, with the goal of providing space for collaboration and community among practitioners to the Muslim diaspora in North America. As people around the world have immigrated to the West, many Christians have realized that they live and work in the midst of the nations, and they often feel alone and unprepared to communicate cross-culturally. If you're looking for conversation and community surrounding issues of loving Muslim friends in Jesus' name, we welcome you into the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. This is Brian. If you are tuning in today, you might be noticing that this podcast is being uh, placed in two different places. So you might know me from the Nations Reaching Nations podcast and be expecting to hear something on diaspora ministry or multi-ethnic ministry. Or you might know me from the Medina Focus podcast, where you're expecting to hear from uh, workers in the Muslim diaspora. And so whichever of those two you are coming from, uh, you are going to uh, definitely hear what you came to hear. And I've got a really exciting guest that highlights an important thing. As I've been doing diaspora ministry now for, uh, I don't know, coming up on 15 years, um, it is uh, amazing the stories that I keep getting to hear from very different people, very different kinds of projects about here's, here's the big picture things of what God is doing through diaspora ministry. And I know for many people, it's a struggle to come back from the field. I know for many organizations, it's a struggle to think of, uh, you know, everywhere being the mission field. Um, and hopefully, you know, through this story and many other stories like it, uh, the, the larger narrative that develops is that uh, missions is not here or there. Uh, it's here and there, and there's integration, and there's, there's crossover uh, between the two. And we see this uh, every day. For those of us who are working in the diaspora, if we're really listening to the bigger picture from our friends, we are getting to hear what are those things uh, that they're still in communication with their family for? What are those points of cultural contact that they still have? What are the what are the artifacts and the experiences that they are still receiving from their home country? And vice versa. When, when I lived overseas, I, I constantly met people who had family living in, you know, six, seven, eight countries. And they're still in contact with them every day. And so what is God doing, not just in giving us an opportunity here in the States or in Europe or a global city like Dubai to reach the diaspora, but what is that second level thing, that exponential thing that God is doing through our various ministries that is, that is impacting world evangelization, global discipleship? And so today I have a very exciting conversation uh, with Trevor. Uh, Trevor was raised in Indiana, and he now lives in San Diego with his wife and three kids. He was trained as a linguist and translator. Uh, that might seem really odd to be a linguist and translator living in San Diego, but we're going to get to to dive into that question. Uh, and then he served in Bangladesh, he served in Bulgaria, and he served as a missions recruiter. Uh, he's currently working with uh, to connect diaspora communities with Bible translation products for creative access countries. So creative access countries are countries where you can't go uh, on a missionary visa and don't have access to just work freely as a Christian. And so we're excited to hear his story today. Trevor, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, so I'm really excited to have you on. I know you and I have have chatted offline and and with Nate and others about some of the the work that you're doing in in translation and so uh, I'm just for the sake of our viewers why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing yeah great so um, the the big picture is translation Bible translation and then it kind of gets more detailed so it's Bible translation with diaspora and then not just diaspora but diaspora that are from difficult to access or creative access countries. And um, then it's not necessarily me doing the Bible translation, even though I have a hand in some projects I'm connected to, but I'm also promoting, advocating for, and participating in Bible translation with diaspora from these countries. So my role is 
to include communities and be strategic and intentional. Um, you know, we've seen uh, translation projects happening around the world with displaced communities for a while, but it hasn't always been really intentional or strategic from the beginning as things got going. So uh, part of my job and my team's job, I, I'm part of a small international team um, working to kind of help make this happen is we want to see this be part of translation projects from the beginning where they're connecting with other language speakers. And then where I'm working is in San Diego. And San Diego is kind of a unique special city when it comes to refugees. Um, you know, uh, San Diego started taking people uh, through a resettlement program back in the 70s from Vietnam. And in fact, I've had conversations with leaders from uh, the church that initiated resettling them. They, they drove up to, um, over here it's Camp Pendleton, and just say, hey, you know, we see the need, we want to help resettle these people. And so um, the services kind of got set up back then. And since then, with things in place, um, you know, we've been resettling uh, quite a few uh, refugees through the program. And of course, we have other immigration and other immigrants. So San Diego is quite a, quite a good place to connect with those who are coming from hard to access countries. Um, we have a huge, one of the biggest populations of Iraqis, um, some estimate up to 80,000 um, just over here. And then, of course, the Vietnamese, Southeast Asia, Middle East, every place where people wow. have been fleeing from bad situations, they've been coming here. So when I think of a translator, um, one of my early mission trips was to Papua New Guinea, and you know they were working with several of the different translation groups, and you know you fly onto a grass airstrip, and then you hike in, and you're in the jungle in a hut, and you know they're they're like, like cracking the code of language and writing it down and coming with a phonetic alphabet, and I'm yeah. I don't think San Diego. Yeah. How did this How did this happen for you? So this is my wife's hometown, actually. And um, so when we came back from our last assignment, we were looking for how to get involved again. And it was her pastor who said, hey, actually, we're looking at reaching out something that would be uncomfortable for us. And we want to do church planning with the Iraqi community here. Mm -hmm. And so we were thinking about what was next. And um, we are not church planters. Chain, you know, I'm trained as a linguist uh, translator. My wife is trained as a literacy worker. And so... Um, we kind of said, you know, we'll be supportive of whatever you guys do, but we, we're not really the trained church planters. But then that kind of got us thinking, well, if there's so many Iraqis here, let's look and see where there's maybe still some languages from Iraq, language communities that, you know, don't have any scripture yet. Mm -hmm. And let's see how that overlaps with the people that have been coming. So that was kind of just it. You know, we're here, we're close, we're local, and there was some local impetus for reaching out and connecting. So that's kind of what we started doing. We started connecting with people that were already on the ground here in ministry and looking to see if they were already connected to people with may maybe a Bible translation need. So that's kind of how it got going. Um, yeah, you know, that idea of, you know, translating uh, in, in the jungle in a small little village is, is a, good, strong, um, a good, strong picture of kind of how things had began. But now we see this happening in much more urban Mm -hmm. um, settings, um, big, more developed cities, that kind of thing, where we have people who are speaking languages without scripture, you know, migrating, moving to right. places, leaving, you know, this is the whole idea of diaspora, right? We're working with diaspora. So wherever those people are, we can meet with them and start to see if they can be a part of Bible translation work. Yeah, that, that's so fascinating, because as you think about how global immigration has become, um, and just thinking of, of what you do, uh, to to go to all of these places that are so remote, obviously it presents so many challenges. You know, geographic, health, safety, technologically, um, and now to think, wow, think of just the American cities or the European and American cities, or mm -hmm. just global cities. You know, cities like uh, Dubai and Rio and other places. This is just a whole new window of opportunity. Yeah. Um, so what, what risks are you taking? Um, yeah, I, you know, the risk is, the risk is kind of in, in the, the task we've taken on is, is promoting Bible translation done remotely outside of the homeland. And, you know, this is not really as well accepted as, mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as what we think it could be or should be. Um, you know, there's a lot of, 
there's some there's some stories in the Bible translation community about um, projects that were started outside of homeland um, that weren't accepted back in the homeland and um, you know they kind of persist but as we you know as we stepped into the space and saw opportunity we wanted to we wanted to say hey let's look at what's happening right now with technology that maybe makes the landscape different than it was 15 mm -hmm. 20 years ago let's look at how some of those specific projects were done where they didn't quite come through in a good way and see if we can overcome that and maybe do it in a better way or do things maybe following best practices that were maybe ignored in the past um, just for a lack of um, resources or something like that so so the the risk is the risk is engaging in translation projects outside of homeland and yeah we we hope that we're learning and we hope that we're overcoming some of those those downsides of you know past stories yeah T technology is certainly changing you know as we talk about diaspora diaspora is a, a concept of uh, of things going from one place to another and, and that can be you know in typically most of the conversations we're having it's it's regarding people but uh, technology, ideas, religions, finances, other things travel f across boundaries, and some boundaries are very porous, others are uh, uh, not very porous. And with technology, that certainly flattened the world. Uh, I was just asked for our church because we have some South Indian members here by a worker in South India if we would partake in some of the discipleship responsibilities for some of their Zoom-based discipleship groups. And basically, this is a new COVID phenomena where mm. they're forced into lockdown. And so their discipleship is already moving online. And so if it's online, then why do the guys on the ground in India have to be the ones? Why can't it be some fellow believers here? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this is what this is some of the excitement that we that we feel has come, you know, from people realizing how accessible um, communities are now through technology and through Zoom and you know other video conferencing stuff that people weren't as willing before to take that step, and we're seeing even now a shift in the last you know nine months that you know even three four years ago as we kind of stepped into the space we were saying hey technology has changed there's more access to mother tongue speakers back to the homeland so we're seeing language stay. Um, more pure longer that kind of a thing mm -hmm. but even even these last nine months things have even changed again i think making the case even stronger so yeah you're, you're totally right yeah that's that's exciting so i mean it sounds like you've already got a pretty solid answer for this but i i like to look at uh kind of innovation and how it works and the unintended consequences of innovation and i noticed this with so many people uh, this is part of my story and so many others who come on the show, their story, where they start trying to do something, and then it's kind of like God puts on their turn signal and sends them into a different lane. And so what are some of the unintended outcomes of, I don't know, your your time in diaspora ministry or translation? Yeah, you know, when, I, when we looked around um, in 2015, 2016, and, and kind of poked our heads up to see what was going on in the immigrant space in San Diego and the refugee space, I, I thought that I was going to be, you know, finding these kind of displaced mother tongue speakers from communities that need a Bible and just connect them right into a, an ongoing project, something like that. Just, I was kind of under the naive assumption that I just had to find these people and then everything else would kind of be taken care of. So, um, that was not true at all. <laughs> um, it never yeah, is. So as I as I did start to meet some people that were mother tongue speakers of languages that needed translation for the Bible, um, I then started realizing that just connecting within the Bible translation community and the Bible translation world was another task in and of itself. Um, you know, I kind of um, I kind of figured it was. Um, one thing, but it turned out to be more than that. Um, connecting, connecting to the to the mother tongue speakers on the ground in San Diego, but then connecting within the Bible translation world, the community, to find out who's got something working already, who's looking for more mother tongue speakers, who can't get something started and would want to find someone that could work with them, and then um, even just within my own organization 
starting to see that there's still some um, kind of, you know, people are a little wary of working with people who aren't in the homeland. So it turned into kind of a, like I said, promoting and advocating role within the Bible translation community more than I thought it would be when I started looking around to see who, who could get connected. I don't know. Yeah. So what are the, I mean, you're in such a unique position here. What are the greatest challenges to your ministry there? Um, yeah, I've kind of alluded to it. It's, it's, I think it's the, some of the prejudice in the Bible translation community against working with people that have left the homeland. And, um, I, I understand the concern. I definitely do. And I, and I know that we've seen things be different in the past. Um, but what we're seeing is we have some colleagues doing some really good research, um, in sociolinguistics, you know, Mm -hmm. the study of how, um, linguistics works with social networks, that kind of thing. Um, and there's something that a term that, that they've, you know, it's, it's good when you start studying stuff, you, you, you give terminology. And so, um, we might have called it something more, uh, more informal, but what they found was people who have left their homeland are spending a lot of time on video conference, um, just kind of turning it on in the kitchen while they cook and just talk to their brother, talk to their mom, talk to their sibling, and just, you know, no intentional, you know, task they're solving, just hanging out online. And um, where I might have called it hanging out online, uh, they've termed this intentional uh, co-presencing. So Hmm. they're going to be present together, co-presencing. So um, that's what we're starting to see happen is six, seven, eight hours a day of co-presencing with people that have left their home. Wow. And so when you're spending that much time speaking your, your mother tongue, you're not getting nearly as much of a shift as you would have gotten, you know, 10, 12, 15 years ago without this chance at all. Right. So, um, yeah, so, so we're starting to say, Hey, yeah, there's maybe some ideas of the past of how things were, but if we're looking for someone to be a part of the translation work, we're going to first start looking for these kind of people. Sure, they're not all doing this, mm-hmm. but there are some who are. And, you know, I've been meeting one. Some of my connections have brought me to some people like that. Um, a woman here who, yeah, she'll spend five, six, seven hours um, talking back to her family. You know, wow. she, and she has she has um, seven siblings. So she has three still in home country. Right. And the other four are scattered around Europe and one, one other here in, in America. And she spends so much time with them. And she's even talking back into... Um, one of these, you know, creative access countries to her nephews. And she's seen, she's seen two of her nephews come to a faith um, in Jesus out of Islam uh, with these kinds of conversations in the past. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're really excited about what technology is bringing for us for the connectivity factor and the options and possibilities for working together. I, as I'm listening to you talk about the sort of theor- theoretical or philosophical debate on uh, homeland translation base versus you know uh, diaspora base for that, it makes me th- it, it, I'm brought back to mind that uh, in many global cultures, particularly in the younger generations, even in the home country, their language is already being inflected by outside sources. There, there's a movie uh, called Chennai Express, which this is a, a Bollywood film. It's about a railroad called the Chennai Express. And in the movie, uh, everything is in subtitles. But as, I, as you just listen, you're hearing uh, uh, Telugu being spoken. And I'd say probably 10% of the movie is in English. Mm. And I, I talked to a, f- a friend of mine who's from that area. And I said, I said, I, I kept, I was baffled by the usage of English words for so many right. different things. He goes, oh yeah. He said, for all of the young people, it's kind of a, not a rite of passage, but sort of a badge of honor, if you will, uh, to be able to sprinkle in some, for them, foreign words. I mean, much like we do in English with French words and that kind of thing. Uh, it, it, it sets you apart to be able to do that. Yeah. Which, which from a Bible translation standpoint has to be super frustrating if you're there working amongst the, the, the Tamil-speaking people, if they're now incorporating English into their popular tongue. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Um, and that's part of the excitement of uh, linguistics and sociolinguistics. <laughs> and, you know, the, 
the... I'm glad you see that as exciting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. That's probably why you do what you do. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, and, and this is a key part of the translation process, is having uh, mother tongue speakers who are um, broad ranging and uh, in the community from, you know, different generations, um, different even uh, class, if you can, to bring them together and really have them come together on the way that they're, they're going to be choosing words and choosing language and, and you know, drafting the, drafting the Bible. So, yeah, and, you know, the people there in the community will be making those choices and maybe they'll get to a point where they do start including some, you know, what we'd call English, you know, English words into some of their thing if they want it to be, you know, a more informal youth translation or something like that. Right, right. So I'm not going to ask what is your position on this, uh, but in Muslim ministry community, uh, there has been a lot of disagreements on how to do ministry, particularly on the area of contextualization. And I think translators in large part were the ground zero for this discussion several years back, and it it turned into a, a very messy uh, discussion, and I, I know there's a lot of really negative fallout. Um, mm. So, you know, this applies to to you as a, a translator and to your organization probably in much deeper ways because there's no way around it um, than it does to other other organizations. But how do you navigate these kinds of disagreements? Yeah, so... Um... When it comes to translation and translations, um, making choices for for words, and and a lot of this comes down to um, what you're referencing is the idea of you know how do we use how how are divine terms for family right. used in translation, and um, the the thing that we have now in place is that uh, any any translation that has a Muslim majority culture um, goes through an extra check. Uh, they in divine familial terms, DFT, it goes through a DFT check um, through people that have been approved and, um, mm. you know, kind of gotten the, the stamp of, of how to do those kinds of things to, to give the translation one more, you know, bit of thoughtfulness and how mm. choices were made in the words that were used. So when it comes to translating and translation, that's an extra piece of things that happen for, for that to make sure that every thing is done, you know, with accuracy and, you know, naturalness in, in mind. Um, for us practically on the ground, um, you know, when, when I'm connecting with other people in ministry here, connecting to other people doing their job, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of common ground and camaraderie and just working together and, You know, I haven't seen uh, arguments over this idea or, you know, how contextualized to be really have any bearing on relationships or actual ministry getting done in my in my sphere. And so I'm really thankful for that. And I think that people who are, you know, I guess, yeah, the people that I get to contact, connect with and work with are really just want to see people's lives changed. And um, I, I think we've found a good place together here doing that kind of a thing. So, yeah. So again, I I think you'll have a unique take on this. Um, Identity is one of the things that many workers struggle with, whether they're uh, overseas, but even I think it's an even harder struggle when you live stateside because your life as a, as a worker is so different um, than the average American and then any expectation, you know, your Muslim friend has on you. I also think in your work, you probably have to have a high degree of trust with people that you're working with for them to to want to work with you. How do you navigate your identity between your translation work? I mean, how do how do people understand you? So i th- I think I'm in a I think I'm in a like you said, kind of a unique place. I currently I've been building my strongest relationships and networking through through believing networks. So I present myself as a, a translator, someone who wants to work with Bible and um, mostly connected to other people who are already believers or other people in ministry who are working with 
people who are believers or seekers. So I'm not really in a place where I'm, um, you know, trying to, um, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I have, I have to hold too much tension in my own relationships because I present myself really clear. And, you know, it's, you know, working with diaspora here in the U S in a major city, you know, I'm personally not in any, um, you know, danger. There's nothing I have to pretend that I'm doing or that I'm not doing. So, um, yeah, I think I've been, I'm, I'm really thankful for the relationships that I have with other people in ministry and that I can kind of just be who I am. And that's kind of the advantage of, you know, sharing about Bible translation is that if people are interested, mm -hmm. they can be drawn in just for that. And then I can work with the people who self-select. I see. I see. So when I think of translation, I have flashbacks to my time in seminary in Greek and Hebrew class. Yeah. Uh, I jokingly tell people that I could have a minor in uh, Greek one. Uh, third time was the charm for me. And uh, <laughs> I say that a little tongue in cheek, but also a yeah. little bit on it confessionally. Um, so, you know, I'm not a I'm not a linguist by any stretch of the imagination. So in my mind, I just imagine uh, your job being very, very difficult and, and taxing. Uh, and then, of course, diaspora ministry of any kind and, and ministry in general is can be very taxing. So how do you, you know, you're you're a husband, you're a father, uh, you've got some translation projects uh, on the books right now. How do you manage all of this? What's your how do you keep a healthy work life balance? Oh, man. Yeah. You know, I, I heard someone talking about this a while back and they and they say they, they'd said something like, um, yeah, you want to balance it, but maybe a better way to think about it is seeing how to get everything in harmony, right? That things work together and one thing can, um, you know, one thing can speak into another part of your life and that sort of a thing. And I don't know, I, that seems, <laughs> it seems like a good idea and maybe a play, you know, maybe it comes down to semantics in that case, but um, I'm, I'm shooting for harmony in my, in my work and life and family, but how do I do it? You know, I don't, I don't even know that I, I don't even know if I even have one hack or one <laughs> thing to even suggest. I, you know, for me, I, I do like, I, I like running. And so I like to get out and run. And I think that's a good place for me to be. Um, you know, I, I can mull over thoughts and right. um, I, I also really do like listening to podcasts. I feel like I've, I've taken in tons of, of new ideas and, um, worldviews through podcasts mm -hmm. and, and listening and, and seeking things out. You know, if I hear of a author with a new book or something, I'll pull up the podcast app and search their name and see who's interviewed them, you know, mm. and see what I can learn from, you know, that person. Um, so I, I do, I run and I listen to podcasts and I think when I'm running regularly, I think I feel more peaceful. I, I'm more, I, I feel like I do have more harmony um, and I'll also say, you know, having kid, you know, kids are, my kids' ages are um, 12, 10, and 6. And my six-year-old daughter, Eden, she still wants, you know, time to play. She wants to just play. Right. And sometimes it's hard to decide to do that with her. But I've learned that if I decide to spend some time with her, get on the floor, sit down on the floor, that seems to make a big difference. And then just say, hey, what are we playing? And then, you know, give – you know, pick up the little, um, I don't even know what we're playing with anymore, you know, little tiny toys, things, LOL dolls or some <laughs> other kind of something, you know, and just try to give some kind of a, a goal to the little person I have and say, hey, you know, this person really wants to go to the beach. And then, you know, she'll have to deal with my insertion of some kind of a narrative of a goal into the <laughs> into the world. Yeah. So, just really taking time, you know, some time every day to play. Yeah, like you said, we're at home now. Our kids are doing online school. Um, so we do have a lot of time together and try to make sure that the kids get some intentional time and I get my time out yeah. running. <laughs> I, I often tell missionaries that I'm training that they need a hobby on the field. And I think it's so easy to be so consumed. Uh, and a lot of a lot of ministry work is not very concrete. Uh, yeah. And so to have something that is very concrete, uh, you know, you could track your miles and your minutes and all that other jazz. I've started, I've picked up uh, cycling again. I did it in high school and I've, I've wow. kind of come back to that this year. And I mean, it's so helpful with the, the stress, uh, the stress level and everything. I'll also, 
I'll also say, you know, we do like board games as, as an escape and we have, we've gathered quite a collection, you know, being overseas a few times, you mentioned, you know, I was in Bulgaria, Bangladesh. So we kind of whittled things down, but now we've been back in the U S for about five years and our shelf of board games has grown. So oh, yeah. um, we like to play games with, you know, friends and our kids are now ages where, where, you know, they'll jump in and play with us. So yeah, that's fun. I like that too. Yeah. So tell us a story. Oh, a story. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, so I, I, as I started connecting here in San Diego with other practitioners, you know, I was looking for connections to communities that still needed Bible translation. And one afternoon I got a call from one of my friends with a question. She, uh, sheepishly asked me, she said, you know, I know you're wanting to do translation for communities that don't have anything, but what about a place where there was a translation, but it's bad? Do mm. you guys do them again? And the, of course the answer is yes, because the goal of a translation is for it to serve the speakers. And if the speakers of a language don't feel like it really speaks to them, then it's not, it wasn't done well or it's not for them. Um, so, so I kind of said, yeah, you know, who, who are we talking about? And so um, I'm going to use a pseudonym here. We're going to we're going to say we're talking about the Aham, the Aham people, the um, speakers of the language Aham. Um, I'll tell you they're from, let's say, North Africa, a few million speakers. So it's a significant size group. Mm -hmm. And this is their situation. They had a, a translation done about 50 years ago and kind of at the time it was done. Um, you know, their language wasn't as um, solidified. Uh, dictionary came out a few years after this translation was finished. Um, There's maybe some older methods used that we know now weren't as weren't as good. Um, specifically, I think the outsider, as they learned a hom, they created the first draft. And the way we do it now is that we'll train mother tongue speakers themselves in translation practices, and then the the mother tongue speaker themselves make the first draft this really helps the this really helps the um the translation be natural right because no matter how long i work spending spend working to learn another language i won't be as as natural as a mother tongue speaker right so um yeah so a few things yeah kind of created that to be a a problem um and maybe it was kind of regional as well um and didn't serve all the all the speakers so I started looking around and seeing what was going on, and I found out, sure enough, there was a group that had already started working on a, a new translation for the for the AHAM speakers. And um, as I talked to one of the consultants on the project, he told me that you know he would describe the the translation as uh, having all the furniture in the room, but it's all in the wrong place. Mm. So. It's, that's not a very comfortable room. You know, if this is your Bible, you don't want to spend time there. You just want to leave. You know, if you walk in and you hit your knees on the sofa, right. there's nowhere to sit down. You're going to walk out. Anyway, so so all that to say there was a need and they were working on a new one. So um, what, what I did was I uh, connected with them. They gave me access to the translation that they had already done. They had finished Jonah and Ruth at the time. And I sat down and met with my contact's um, friend, who speaks a hum and we sat down and went through uh, Jonah and Ruth. They had done it um, also in audio. So I played the audio and followed through on the text. And um, uh, this Aham speaker's feedback was just, I mean, she sat there saying, um, she was just saying, wow, this is so easy to understand. Of course, mm. I get to talk to her in English because she's been here in America now for a few years and she's, she's a great English speaker. Um, but of course she still speaks a hum. And so, um, we get to interact. I don't need to learn a hum to talk to her, but then she's saying, wow, you know, this is so easy to understand. I, I didn't think scripture should be this easy to understand. And I said, <laughs> yes, yes, it is. This is the, this is the idea, right? We want it to be natural and clear and for you to really understand it. So, you know, I gave the feedback to the translation team and they said at the time that was the best feedback they'd have because um, if you think of the translation process as maybe like three phases, the first phase is, the mother tongue speaker making the first draft. Um, they do as, as good as they can. And then working with a, a facilitator, like someone like me trained in translation, they get the first draft done. The second phase is getting feedback from the community, a comprehension check. And so because of the 
the difficulty in, in publicizing the work that the team was doing, they were having a hard time finding enough mother tongue speakers to be mm-hmm. comprehension checkers. And so for me to sit with the mother tongue speaker right here in San Diego at a coffee shop and share Jonah and Ruth with her and get feedback to the team was invaluable. So the, you know, the consultants said it was the best feedback they'd had so far. The third phase is that in, um, after the community checks is a consultant checks it, someone who's trained in translation, has already been through a project, and is familiar with how things could can be. And then they look at what you've done and compare it to for the Old Testament Hebrew so that you're making sure you stay accurate and for the New Testament Greek. So we're seeing a key role happening here for the second phase, right? Finding other mother tongue speakers to help in community checking. And so once we realized that, you know, the AHAM team was putting scripture on a secure website, um, we could give access to other people to then sit and do what I did anywhere in the world. So for the wow. past two years, since I sat down with that first person, what I've been doing is I've been finding other people who are already in ministry with the home speakers um, who can get access to that scripture online in the secure in a secure website and then share that and get feedback. And it's a pretty cool program called Scripture Forge. Um, really cool at place for you know holding the stuff and then being able to get feedback you can type in your answers you can even do an audio recording there so that the aham speaker themselves you could just push the button and then they can answer in aham the aham translation team can then just listen it doesn't have to be a middleman doesn't have to be translated into english or whatever other language might be your medium so um so this is what we're seeing now is now i have a few people all over the united states and even someone in europe who's you know sitting with and working with the aham speakers to get feedback to that team for comprehension checks and now they're on through genesis and exodus and so a lot of cool things are happening so this is kind of one story where we see god working using right, um, right. there's value in diaspora right because they're in a safe place because they're away from it um but they can also still contribute so mm. some of, some of the what we're doing yeah that's 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 an amazing story a- again i, I mean i I've been studying diaspora stuff now, I guess for 10 years. And I'm always looking for the, what's the, what's the value added beyond just our project. And yeah. so, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited and, and at the same time kind of just baffled or dumbfounded, uh, by, by what, uh, by what's happening there. I'm, I'm super excited about I that. I would say, you know, you said value added and, and, you know, I kind of see it as a threefold value here, right? So, the ministry worker working with the home speakers gets to come and bring something to that relationship, right? They can offer to say, hey, do you want to see the, the, the scripture in your language? And where a lot of times we're finding people ministering with the home workers are being asked if they'll read the Quran, right? And so they can kind of give a, an answer back, say, you know, if you want, I'll read, you know, if you want me to look at Quran, how about you look at this? And now we can look right in the home at Jonah, Ruth, you know, Jonah, mm-hmm. Ruth, or the early one. So there's that value. They're bringing something to the relationship. Um, of course, if they're a seeker or if they're a believer, the other value is that this person is being exposed to scripture, right? In a language that really speaks to them that they can understand. So they're going to grow. They're going to take a step in their faith or they're going to grow in their faith. And then the third value is if they give some feedback to the translation team, then they're going to make an be- even better translation. So we really feel like it's a win-win-win for you right. know, getting things going, getting diaspora involved. So it's pretty exciting. Yeah, and, and just the technology, you're almost crowdsourcing, I mean, to a degree. Yes. I mean, there's an element that's, that's, that's just pulling, much like we would with other things that we're using, you know, crowd-based information gathering to help exactly. with. So that's that's fantastic. So what's what's something that that you've discovered you think other practitioners need to know? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I in working with you know languages and different languages, mother tongues and um, many tongues, that kind of a thing. What we've learned is that people who are doing ministry with people who have come from other places can deepen their relationship with the people they're already working with if they ask really intentionally about what languages that person speaks. Hmm. So it can really open up a relationship to go to another level. Um, as you start to ask, you know, okay, you're from, you know, where are you from? Oh, you know, this place, that place, or, um, well, asking what language they speak, or maybe then what language their parents speak, what language did your mother speak? What language did your father speak? What language do you speak at home? Hmm. What's your favorite of those languages? Because as we start meeting people from, mainland Southeast Asia, the Middle East, North Africa. Right. They're going to have one or two maybe tribal languages 
we'd call them tribal languages, you know, languages that aren't as established. Um, but as you ask the person in a very um, caring way about languages that they have that are a part of them, then they feel a stronger connection. And then, um, you know, also I see it as well. Also, as you ask these questions, you're going to learn maybe something more about their country, That's where true. they're from. And then maybe you can also look and see, uh, and do they have the Bible, right? And then, of course, if not, we want to know, we want to say hi and connect to me and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. But, um, may, but if they do, then, you know, you can look it up on a Bible app and maybe help them see, oh, you know, did you know? You know, the Bible has already been translated into your language, one of your one of your parents' languages. Maybe you haven't had access to it yet. Let's look it up. Let's find it for you. So mm-hmm. I think getting other practitioners to have that conversation more intentionally and slowly about what languages their friends speak, um, I think could really strengthen and deepen that that friendship, that relationship. I, I think that's a great word. Um, an- another couple questions on that that I like asking people is what language do you dream in? And if they're a married couple, this is a fun one. You have to know them a little bit better, but what language do you fight in? Oh. And especially if they're both multilingual from different languages, like what, uh, you know, what communicates the most passion or <laughs> right. has, the, has the best insults? I don't know. How do you fight? Uh, <laughs> yeah. 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 You know, I've, we have a lot of, uh, Nigerians here in, in our church, but in, uh, Houston as well. And I've found what you're saying to be true. I, I haven't done it consciously as a way to connect deeper. I'm just, I guess, naturally curious and ask a lot of questions. Mm. And so as I've asked people, where are you from? Okay. What language group are you from? All of a sudden, when they say something and I go, oh, yeah, uh, they're they're kind of baffled. You, you really get a lot of free points by just mm-hmm. asking that second question. Yeah. So that's, that's really great. I might have to be more intentional about that now that you now that you've kind of put a, a point on it. Yeah. So if God would answer one prayer with a yes, what would you ask? OK, I, you know. I want to see I want to see the Bible accessible to people who need it, and um, I think the ask would come to this. I I would ask God to quickly bring together collaborative, coordinated, community led efforts for Bible translation, and every community that needs it, every language community that needs it, mm-hmm. and show us how we can join in. I just I I want it all. I you know of course I want it. You know, I'm tempted to just say, let's just ask God to make that scripture accessible. But I think there's so much value and beauty in the process Mm. that I think I'm going to just have the request be like one step before, right? Like ask him to just bring together the communities, the coordinated efforts to make things be in process. Then, you know, how can we join in and and be part of that? Man, I, I think that's really great. So often we're we're focused on the goal of what do we want to have, and I'm I'm certainly this way that we forget the process, and then we're kind of surprised by oh wow look at this beautiful community that's developed look at the kind of collaborative spirit and the innovation and the uh, the the journey not just the destination. So I think that's really great. Yeah, yeah. Well, Trevor, uh, I'm very. Th- very grateful for you for coming on the show, yeah. and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from your wife uh, here at some point uh, in the near future as well. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's excited to share as well. Cool. So that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, next time we are going to have Trevor's wife. She's going to be joining us, and she's got some very uh, interesting things to share about her perspective uh, on how agencies can uh, be more welcoming and be more global in their uh, work culture. And this will be more welcoming to international people to work uh, amongst us, to work with us, to partner with us. And so I'm looking forward to hearing that conversation. In the upcoming year, we're going to be making a little bit of a shift in season two that I'm really excited about. Uh, We're going to be having some group discussions We've got a number of topics that relate to uh, diaspora ministry amongst Muslims. Uh, some of these topics are going to be things like what is the the global impact of diaspora ministry? And so we'll have stories like this one that Trevor shared today uh, amongst many, many others. 
Uh, we're going to talk about things that are very practical for any missionary. You don't have to be a diaspora ministry to have returned from the field. Uh, if you're back from the field and, and you're kind of in year one, what are the struggles? What are the things you are going to be going through? And how do you come to health and to peace with what has transpired? Uh, if you're starting a diaspora ministry, what does year one look like? That'll be another topic. And so we've got a lot of fun topics and some great uh, people that we're going to be interviewing and interacting with on these various topics. And so I hope that you will rejoin us again in season two next year. You've been listening to the Medina podcast. This show is hosted by Brian A. Bear and produced by Nate Schultz. The conversations we have on this program are born out of an expanding environment of collaboration among grassroots ministry practitioners across the North American continent. If you'd like to engage on a deeper level, please email us at medinafocus at vision59.com.